on the okay. so thanks for on the invitation from the organizer and to, today uh, i'm talking about this uh, free multiplier uh, results and this is a uh, a joint work with uh, Zhao Chen and Martin Shi and uh, Christoph Tiller. So uh, let us start from two classical Fourier multiplier theorems. So uh, what is a uh, Fourier multiplier TM associated to a bounded function M? Uh, so it is the operator that you first take the Fourier transform of F, then times the function M, then uh, do the inverse Fourier. So this is called a Fourier multiplier. So in 1956, Michelin first built up a multiplier theorem. So he says that TM is bounded on P for P between one and infinity if the multiplier satisfying the, the following bound for alpha that less than this number. So uh, this number is the least integer, which is larger than one half of the dimension. And this uh, condition roughly it tells us that this M behave like a homogeneous function of degree of, of degree zero. And the only singularity of this M is only at the origin. And four years later, Permander just generalized these results in a way that he used this uh, sublet norm. So this HS is a L2 base, a non-homogeneous sublet norm. Yeah. And here, if this M satisfies that for s greater than one half of the dimension, then this TM is bounded on LP. And what's the relation between this Michelin condition and the Hermander condition? So for example, if this a number is some A, then we call it A Michelin. And if this number is also some A, we call it A Hermander. So if a, if a multiplier is A Michelin, then it's also A Hermander. And so this is uh, really a generalization of the Michelin's results. Okay, so these are the two uh, classical uh, free multiplier theorems. And they are linear. Now we jump into the multilinear setting. So how do we define a multilinear free multiplier associated to a bounded function M? We define in a similar uh, manner. So we first take the Fourier transform of each function, then times them together, and times the M and do the inverse Fourier. So this is what we call a multilinear Fourier multiplier. Yeah, and in 1978, Kirkman Mayer just first, uh, Kirkman and Mayer, they just first put up a multilinear Fourier multiplier theorem. So this uh, TM is bounded from LP1 times LPN to LP uh, for P between one and infinity in this Herder exponent, if the multiplier satisfy the following Michelin bound. For these uh, multi-index, the number less than L, and L is sufficiently large. So they didn't tr try to see what is the sharp L in their paper. And later, uh, Stein and Koenig and Robert Koss and Toros, they just generalized this results into some non-binary region. Okay, so uh, we can also ask for the multilinear extension of Commander's results. So uh, Tomita in the 2010, so he also get the, he also obtained the multilinear version of Commander's results and uh, TM is bounded when this S is greater than one half of the dimension times the linearity. And also, uh, in two years and three years later, Gravakas and Shi and Gravakas and Yachi and Tomita, they just uh, generalized these results into some non banach region. And so these are basic, some um, well-known results in the multilinear frame multiplier. And later, we want to ask, what about some frame multiplier with some higher dimension singularity? Because in those, for example, Kochman case, the singularity is just at origin. And we are wondering whether we can say something about the multiplier when the singularity is not just origin, it's some non-trivial singularity. 
Yeah, so now we consider the following Bavinian Hilbert transform. And so, for example, if we don't have this F2, X plus beta T, then it's just a usual uh, Hilbert transform. And now we have this kind of F2, X beta T is a uh, Bavinian Hilbert transform. And it can be written into the multiplier form. So now uh, I use this red uh, letter. So this is the multiplier in the Bavinian-Hilbert transform. It's sine C1 minus beta C2. So we can see that the singularity is at the line C1 equals to beta C2. Yeah, unlike in the case of the kirkman mayer Okay, so, um, but now the range of the exponent, unlike the kirkman mayer so the red to extend the range of the exponent is, I would say, harder. So uh, Lacey and Tile they first built up the bound in the local two region. So this is this triangle. Yeah, and two years later they just extend the range into this one, the larger one. So now the target is target space. The p is greater than a two third. There's still a little space between a two third and one half and this part is still unknown whether we have bound in this part because when the target space p is less than one half then we know that there's some counter example and also uh, now we look, look back at this uh, volume transform we have this beta so for example uh, when beta equals to zero and minus one so we get some uh, degenerate case yeah, and the bound, so in the first two papers, the bound depends on the beta. When the beta approach the degenerate direction, uh, the bound will blow up. Yeah, and later uh, they just build up some results, which is uniform in the parameter beta. So uh, Tiller in 2002, Grafters and Lee in 2004 and 2006, they build up a uniform bound in this region too. Yeah, and later, quite recently, uh, Gennady, Yosef, and Ho Wachowski, they just uh, built up a uniform bound in the four range of the Hilbert transform. Yeah, four range in the sense that now we already know the bound in this region three. And also, we can generalize this kind of uh, Hilbert transform into unlinear a multiplier with the singularity of small dimension. And this is a result by uh, Ms. Clue, and Tiller in 2002. And here, why I say this is small is because, for example, if we want to do this uh, trilinear uh, Hilbert transform and we write it into the multiplier form, then the singularity, the dimension is a bit large that their method cannot apply. So their method only can apply to those uh, multiplier whose singularity is not that large. Okay, so now we can ask two natural questions. So um, for bilinear a multiplier with non-trivial singularity, what's the least regularity required? So the least here means that, for example, um, the Hermander condition, the HS, what is the least S that we need so that the uh, multiplier operator is bounded? And the second question is, how rough can the singularity be? So we know that if the singularity is something like a hyperspace, a hyperplane, then the dimension cannot be too large. Yeah. But what if we don't consider this kind of hyperplane? If the singularity is, for example, some curve or some fractal, how can we say about this kind of singularity? OK, so. Uh, Today, we will answer these two questions. OK, so if the follow is the, our main results. So we define the binary Fourier uh, multiplier associated to this function m in the beta direction in the following. <laughs> so in the Balini Hilbert transform, the m here is just a sine function. Yeah, and the end here we consider is some multiplier which satisfy the Hermander condition. 
Yeah, so our theorem states that if the beta is not zero and minus one, which is the degen degenerate uh, direction, then the operator is bounded in the local to red in the local to region. If the multiplier m satisfy uh, s Hermander condition and s is greater than one, okay, and this one is sharp, yeah. And uh, in the following, we will do our analysis in the trilinear form. So uh, we can dualize this balloon operator into a trilinear form. And we will work in this uh, more symmetric trilinear form. Yeah, so this V is the uh this V is the orthogonal of the vector one 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 here. Okay, so now uh, we need to think what is the correct Hermander condition for a Lipschitz curve. So this V is the hyperplane 111. And uh, this uh, gamma is a set in V. So for now, you can think of this, this set as, a, for example, Lipschitz curve so far. OK. So all we need is that for all gamma and gamma prime belongs to this capital gamma. and for example, J, now we just fix this J close to one. Then, uh, so this is the orthogonal of E1 is this standard vector one, zero, zero. Yeah, and we just, the orthogonal, we just pro project the orthogonal on the hyperplane V. So this is like the forbidden direction. So this condition here tells us that so in this forbidden direction, we can all, we can have a little double cone here. And all the singularity must light, must lie out of this double cone, which means that the singularity must lie in another two uh, double cone, uh, in, in, in an, another double cone. Yeah, and we want this hole for uh, all the forbidden direction. And if, this is true. For example, uh, if this gamma is a connected set, and this is true, then this gamma is really a Lipschitz curve. But in our case, this gamma can be, for example, disconnected, can be also a fractal. And because this condition is what we really need in our analysis. Yeah. We don't want this gamma. There are some local, for example, little segment. This gamma. Are parallel to some forbidden direction. This will destroy our analysis. Yeah. So how we really need how we really need is this condition here. And this delta is more or less like the Lipschitz constant. Okay. So now uh, after we clarify what is the Lipschitz curve we mean, now we want to put the correct condition on the want to put the correct Remainder condition on this singularity. So we may write the usual Hermander condition in this way. So this means that part. So uh, this part is like the wave packet. So this phi beta j is a L2 normalized bump centered at beta. J was the scale the gamma beta. Yeah, so here this guy just uh, inherits the information of the physical uh, localization and also the frequency one. Yeah, and the scale. Usually we have a scale parameter T. The T is encoded in this the gamma beta. Yeah, so for, for example, if you fix a alpha J and you fix a beta J, then we know that this is something like in the spatial side, localized in alpha j and the scale is something like the reciprocal of the gamma beta and uh, in the frequency side localized at, at beta and the radius is something like uh, the gamma beta. So this is a wave packet. Okay. And uh, 
in, in the following while trying to bound this trilinear form. So this trilinear form, um, the underlying space is V times R3 and V is a two dimension uh, hyperplane. So our strategy is we will decompose the underlying space V times R3 into certain generalized tense. Yeah, and use an algorithm to select tens with certain size. And in each tens, we will dominate the trilunar form by the product of size of each function. And the last one, we need to do some modification in order to get a sharp regularity. Yeah, usually the last one, we call it a tenth estimate. Okay, so now, I first introduce some geometry that we need in our analysis. So uh, this gamma is still the singularity and we define a 10 as follow. So TJ is defined to be I times WJ. And this I is an interval in real and WJ is a truncated cone. And here, uh, I, what I mean, the modulus of WJ means that, so in this truncated cone, the length of this interval, this is what I mean, the modulus of the w, WJ. Yeah. And we want the length of the I and WJ, their product equals to one. So this is due to the uncertainty principle. Okay, so for example, um, if this is uh, one forbidden direction, for example, in the third direction, so this is the W3, is the, is the truncated cone associated to the third direction. Yeah. And this guy is just like the tenth. Yeah. And but here we need to have some uh, generalized tent. The reason is that, for example, in the usual Kleckman Mayer or Balinger transform, the different frequency parts, they all share the same uh, spatial interval. But now uh, in, our, in our case, we can have alpha one, alpha two, alpha three. We can have some uh, spatial interval, which center at different points. Yeah, so now our spatial data is not just a one dimension data, but three dimension data. And so I mean a generalized tent is the interval is replaced. So this is something like a slab. So it's something like, for example, I times R2 or R times I times R. This kind of slab for some I equals to one, two, three. Okay. So um, this is how I call a uh, tenth and uh, truncated cone. And the most important, uh, the key key estimate in our result is the following ten estimate. So we first define what the size. So if you given a tenth t, what is the j size? It's something like you take the soup over a L2 average quantity and the L infinity quantity. Yeah, and this in the first size seems to be a bit weird, but I mean, why we define these quantities? Because in our analysis, there pumps, pumps out these two quantity, and we want a quantity that can uh, dominate both of these quantities. So that's the reason why this quantity just pump out. And the global size is the soup of this local size over the all possible tent. So this is called the J J size of this capital F. Yeah, and the following is the key proposition in our uh, analysis, the tent estimate. So if E is a generalized tent, then the trilinear form on this um, generalized tender or one norm is bounded by the product of the J size 
of each function times the size of the tent. Okay, so this is the tent estimate. Yeah, and so uh, here we need to do an uh, important uh, decomposition. So we need to decompose the physical part of the kernel uh, into different scale. So, so now in each scale, I mean, now we have, for example, three uh, different interval in the spatial site. And now they seems to be quite random, randomly spread. We don't know how to control. But if we fix in, for example, the k-scale, then, I mean, these interval, they are differ at most two to the power k. So this means that, for example, if I fix one alpha one, then the alpha two and alpha three, they cannot be far away from this alpha one. They can be at most two to the power k away from this alpha one. Yeah. And also, uh, on this ek, we have a L2 estimate on this ek, and it's bounded by the two to the power ks. And this s, the regularity, pump, pump up at this point. Yeah, so uh, it suffice to de derive an estimate of the following form. So for each ek, if we can have the following form, and if, for example, this s is greater than one, then we can just sum over all k, because then if f is greater than one, then this guy is uh, geometric. So we can just sum over and get the desired 10 estimate. So we can also see why s greater than one is because here. Okay, so now um, in the usual, for example, in the usual bilinear transform, the 10 estimate is just a single herder inequality. Uh, infinity L2, L2 herder inequality, we can get a single 10 estimate or what we call a tree estimate, single tree estimate. Yeah, but here, uh, because our spatial interval, they are somehow spreading away. So we cannot use a single tree estimate to deal with this guy. Yeah, so the idea, the idea behind is, so although now the three uh, spatial interval, they are spreading away, but for example, in the EK, they are most uh, two to the power K far away to each other. So if their lengths, for example, are something like larger than two to the power K, then it seems to be the same interval. Or you just shift one to the right or one to the left, then you can cover other two. Yeah. So what's important now is we need to split into two cases. We need to split our 10 into two cases. One case is <coughs> one case is the first uh, k scale and the other is the rest scale. Yeah, so in the other scale, out of the first k scale, since the since the length of those intervals are larger than two to the power k, so the difference between the center is not that important. Then we can use some analysis similar to the before those L two L two and infinity further, and for example. L2 on the lacunary direction and infinity on the non lacunary direction. Uh, and in the first the case scale, we need to use a little bit different analysis. And at the end, this part will pump, pump out a, a factor k. But this k is a harmless. Just compared to this 2 to the power k, this is just like a log scale. So this is harmless scale here. Yeah, so rough, roughly speaking, uh, we split our tent, our generalized tent into two guy. One guy is the frequency part, is this this part. Another guy is the frequency part, is the rest part. 
And the first guy dominated by this quantity, and the second guy dominated by this dominated by this quantity. Yeah, and let us see how these cages appear. <coughs> so um in our analysis we have Okay, so this is our trilinear form. So we have this kind of the, the alpha and the beta. Sorry. And we need to do some different further um, corresponding to this alpha and this beta. So um, in the first case, in the beta, we do something like L1 and the infinity herder. Well, where the L1 is the underlying uh, support. So at the end, we need to do an integration of this the beta over the gamma beta square on this blue region. And here we need to use the property that the gamma is a uh, is a Lipschitz curve. So this means that, for example, the gamma beta, the distance between the point to the singularity is comparable. I mean, in this column, the distance to the singularity is, compare, compar is comparable to the vertex here. So in this column, this the gamma beta is roughly like one over t square, and t is the distance between the point here to this vertex. Yeah. So at the end, we can just do a direct calculation and get. So this is a uh, integration of one over t is log from one to two to about k. So it's a k here. Yeah. So this is the reason why we get this a uh, harmless k. So um, this is a key key estimate in our analysis because without this key estimate, we cannot get a sharp uh, regularity S. So before we also try to do some other estimate without splitting into two, and the best we can obtain is something like this uh, S is greater than uh, three half, but it's not something like s greater than one. Okay, so uh, is there any question? Okay. So at the end, I want to give some uh, remark and comment. So um. So the first first question is. Uh, can we extend the range of the exponents? So we know that, uh, for, for example, if we, in the Balinpa transform, if we want to extend the range out of local L2, we need to have some kind of restricted V-type estimate. And how this restricted V-type estimate will affect our regularity S. So this is still unknown. And also from the Hermander side, we know that out of the Banach region, for example, p less than one, then the regularity s will depend on the exponent. Not just, for example, now in the local two, we are something like uh, this exponent free. Or for example, in the Banach case, in the usual Hermander one is something like one half of the linearity times the dimension is uh, exponent is free. Yeah. So this is first question. Can we extend the range of the exponents? And the second question is, can we get a uniform estimate? So can we have the bound independent of the Lipschitz constant delta? Because we, we expect that we can get certain results because in the bilinear bi transform, we have some uniform estimate. Now, here we're we're not sure whether we can have this one. 
because now the geometry is even more rough. Yeah. So these are the two questions that I want to study in the future. And the last one is the, I want to ask the hermetic condition for other singular breaths can be formed and singular pyramidic fire. So we know that uh, in this kind of singular frame of the fire, the analysis is quite different. For example, the one Kuiper Mayer, the Balilian the transform, and the twisted pearl product, the analysis is quite different. Yeah, and I want to study that. Um, is there a, a universal way to lift from the Michelin condition to the Fermented condition? So for example, now we know that in our case, the key estimate, how to get a sharp regularity hides in the 10th estimate. And I'm wondering whether, for example, in the twisted pearl product, this is also the case. If we just try to improve the single tree estimate, can we also get the twisted pearl product, which uh, where the multiplier satisfies the remainder condition? with the shock regularity condition. Yeah, so I think these are the three possible uh, future direction. Yeah, so uh, this is the end of my talk and thanks for your attention.